I am presenting Union Gospel Press's Sunday School Lesson Number 12, Sunday, August 18th, 2024. The lesson is entitled, A Servant Girl Points Naaman to God. Lesson text comes from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 and 9 through 15a. Related scriptures are Leviticus 14, 1 through 7, Matthew 8, 5 through 13, Luke 4, 24 through 27, and 17, 11 through 19. The places are Syria, Samaria, and Jordan River. The time is between 848 and 852 BC. It is easy for Christians to fall short of God's best because of pride. When we are proud, we discount the need for God in our lives. Today's aim, facts, to show the circumstances of Naaman's condition and his pride. Principle, to explain that pride gets in the way of God's solutions for us. Application, to exhort students to adopt a humble attitude toward God as they seek answers for him. Illustrating the lesson. Pride and obedience can keep us from God's answers for us. Practical points. One, all of people's worthy accomplishments come ultimately from the Lord. 2 Kings 5, 1. Two, life's apparent coincidences are in reality God's momentous movements for our good. Verse 2. Three, even a small testimony for the Lord can lead to his great glory and praise, verses three through five. Four, the proud seek people's praise rather than God's pleasure and will, verses nine through 11a. Five, pride keeps us from the full blessing of God, verses 11b through 12. Six, to really deal with our pride, we must submit to God's will, verses 13 through 14. Seven, man's pride and God's glory cannot coexist, cannot coexist, verses 15, verse 15a. Golden text. Then when he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Second Kings 5.14. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is hurt pride, Second Kings 5, 1 through 5. The second is angry pride, Second Kings 5, 9 through 12. And the third is no pride, Second Kings 5, 13 through 15a. Introduction. Corey Ten Boom told a story about a proud woodpecker that was tapping away at a dead tree when the sky unexpectedly turned black and the thunder began to roll. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning struck the old tree, splintering it into thousands of pieces. Startled but unhurt, the haughty bird flew away, screeching to its feathered friends, Hey, everyone, look what I did, look what I did. Sinful pride goes out of a self-centered attitude and often leads to exaggeration and deception in misleading others. None of these, none of this pleases God. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 lists seven things the Lord hates. And the first thing on the list is a proud look. Proverbs 16, 18 states, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Our lesson reinforces the call to humble ourselves before God's mighty hand. 1 Peter 5, 6. Hurt Pride, Second Kings 5, 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Verse 2, and the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Verse 3, 
And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Verse 5. And the king of Syria said, Go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. A mighty man with a problem. Second Kings 5, 1 through 2. Just to the northeast of Israel was the nation of Syria or Aram. King Ben-Hadad the first was ruling Syria while Jerome ruled in Israel. The main character in this incident is neither of these kings. Four phrases at the beginning of this chapter describe the importance of the man Naaman. First, he was the captain of the army of Syria, the supreme commander of the king's military force and directly accountable to the king himself. Second, Naaman was a great man. He was esteemed as a prominent person in the nation and enjoyed a high social standing among the people. Third, he was highly regarded by his master. The word honorable means he was lifted high in the eyes of the king. He was such a capable military leader that the king regarded him as one of the most valuable members of his administration. Scripture clarifies that it was the Lord who gave victory to Iram through Naaman, so that Naaman's great standing was through God alone. The Lord was, the Lord has control over all the nations of the world. Isaiah put this in perspective. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Isaiah 40, 17. Finally, Naaman was a mighty man in valor. 2 Kings 5, 1. This refers to his courage and the forceful strength with which he handled himself. All these magnificent truths were tempered by the fact that Naaman had a skin disease, a sort of leprosy, but perhaps not Hansen's disease with its extremely debilitating effects. It was on a military raid inside of Israel that a young girl was captured and given to Naaman's wife as a servant. A servant girl with a solution, 2 Kings 5, 3 through 4. Naaman and his wife may have been kind to this young girl, for in the time of her master's distress, she became concerned for his welfare. Perhaps it was one of those momentary thoughts put into words, or perhaps she had been thinking about it for a while. In any event, one day she said to her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, he, for he would recover him of his leprosy. She was referring to Elijah, the well-known prophet of Israel. The maiden's role in the story is, is striking. She had seen the war crimes perpetrated by the Syrians. By the Syrians. She was bereft of her parents, rather through military conflict or otherwise. She was, in fact, a young girl stolen from her home. Yet, this unnamed maiden felt true compassion toward her captor and master. Discerning God's call that she, a daughter of Abraham, should be a blessing to the Gentiles, she dared profess that the prophet in Samaria could heal Naaman. Naaman reported to the king what the young girl had said. The claim may have seemed wholly impossible, for there was no cure for leprosy. It was a disease that ranged anywhere from white spots on the skin to running, open sores, and in some forms resulted in the gradual loss of fingers and toes and other parts of the body. At its worst, it gradually rotted away the body until the person died. What was Naaman's attitude when he reported to the king? 
<coughs> was he merely passing on information? Was he hope was he hoping to be given permission to travel to Samaria? We must have had a measure of hope in his heart. And the person who could do something about it was his master, the king, a desperate man with a letter. Second Kings five, five. The king immediately responded to the news positively. His commander was very valuable to him, and unless something could be done to heal him, he would eventually lose him to the increasingly devastating effects of leprosy. The king's attitude was probably similar to that of people today who are willing to try any treatment for a life-threatening illness in the hope that something might work. He made all the necessary preparations, therefore, to send Naaman to Samaria, Israel's capital. We must remember that all this was happening because of something said by a young slave girl who was convinced that Elijah had supernatural power to heal Naaman. By this time in his ministry, Elijah had performed a number of miracles. Apparently, word about him had spread. He had, for example, cured a large pot of stew that had poisoned his gourds in it, 2 Kings 4, 38 through 44. Prior to that, he had raised the young boy back to life, verses 32 through 37, and had increased a widow's last small amount of oil, making it impossible for her to get out of debt, making it possible for her to get out of debt, verses 1 through 7. The international scene was volatile. Naaman could hardly march a band of soldiers into Israelite territory without serious repercussions. So the king wrote a diplomatic letter to the Israelite king and sent it with an extraordinary amount of silver and other gifts. No mention of the prophet, however, was written in the letter, and the letter supposed that the Israelite king could perform the healing. In response, the Israelite king thought that the letter had a request for healing were nothing but a pretense for war, for the king had no power to heal. In a fit, he ceremoniously ripped his royal robes, wondering what would happen next. Ironically, the king of Israel, the very one who should know God's prophet, did not seem to know about Elijah, although the little slave girl did. When word of the incident came to Elijah, he rebuked the king for tearing his royal garments, telling him to send Naaman to him so that Naaman would know that there is a true prophet in Israel. Angry Pride Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. Verse 10, and Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Verse 11, but Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, I thought he would, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Verse 12, and are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. A simple command, 2 Kings 5, 9 through 10. Naaman had traveled in a chariot pulled by horses, probably an impressive vehicle worthy of his position and stature. Soon he arrived at Elijah's front door, and surely Naaman's heart was filled with anticipation and excitement. As he waited outside, Elijah sent a messenger with some instructions for him. The instructions were simple and were accompanied by a specific promise. Naaman was to go wash in the Jordan River, putting himself under the water seven times. 
After doing so, his flesh would be fully healed. The fact that Elijah simply sent a messenger out to Naaman reveals that he was not overly awed by the presence of Naaman. Here was the second most powerful man of Syria at his door, but he did not even bother to go out personally to greet him. The man wanted to be healed, and Elijah had a simple means by which that could be accomplished. The important thing was to get the word to him so that he could follow through and be healed. A furious reaction, 2 Kings 5, 11 through 12. This is where the pride of Naaman becomes obvious. Upon receiving the message from Elijah, he became very angry and gave two reasons for his reaction. First, he expected some type of ceremony worthy of a man of his stature. How dare the prophet send a mere servant with a message instead of coming out himself and calling ceremoniously on his God. He should have waved his hand over the leprosy and performed a miraculous healing healing himself. Instead, he had sent a messenger. It is it not amazing to observe the attitude of self-importance on the part on the part of many who are idolized by the masses. On particularly one particularly sad trend these days is the idolizing of young entertainers who are not able to handle the attention maturely. We hear repeatedly of their ruin due to the fame and fortune that comes their way. Many of them could and should be role models for those who follow their careers, but instead we read of their turn to lives of promiscuity, extravagance, and, ab and abnormal be expectations of attention. Those of us who know the Lord should remember that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of Lights, James 1.17. When we are usually blessed, we must recognize that God is the cause and we do not deserve any credit for ourselves. We must keep a balanced perspective even when he does see fit to give us fame and fortune. The second reason for Naaman's anger was the fact that he had been told to wash in the Jordan River. He acted strongly with typical prejudice. He deemed two rivers in Syria as superior to the Jordan. Disappointed that Elijah did not wave his hand over his leprosy or perhaps some other mystical gesture, he went off angry. No pride. Verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much better rather than he when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Verse 14. Then when he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Verse 15. And he turned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all earth but in Israel. A reasonable suggestion, 2 Kings 5, 13-14. Naaman had servants with him who could view the situation more objectively than he could. They approached him and addressed him tenderly and respectfully, referring to him as their father. They pointed out to him that if he had been asked to do some great demanding deed, his healing would have been worth whatever effort that would take. Why not then try something that was such a simple act of obedience? We must give Naaman credit for at least being teachable. He listened to his subordinates and acted on their recommendation. One of the marks of pride is an unwillingness to listen to the ideas of others when they are different from our own. Sometimes other people actually do have good ideas and may even be better than one's than our own. Having put aside his pride, Naaman went down into the Jordan River and, and dunked himself under the water seven times, just as Elijah had said he should. 
Then God then honored his humble spirit and completely and instantly healed him of his leprosy. Naaman might well have felt a tingle of shame after hearing his servant's reasonable argument, but now he certainly must have had a totally different spirit. Not only did God cleanse him of his disease, but he also restored his skin to the freshness and purity of a little child. It is not certain whether there was a special significance to washing seven times. Seven is a number of completion or perfection in the Bible. In some of some uh, some consider it to be a symbolic number of the covenant God had made with Israel. What is important is to see that God gave specific instructions that had to be followed completely if healing was going to take place. This is a good reminder to us that we must not pick and choose what parts of God's word we are going to obey to the exclusion of other parts. Rather, we must obey completely. A changed heart, 2 Kings 5.15a. We do not know how how many were accompanying Naaman in his entourage, but there appears to have been a large number of companions. It was a caravan of royal proportions, and the entire caravan now returned to Elijah's house. A much different spirit was present this time, however. The once proud Naaman was now deeply grateful to the prophet who had not even bothered to come out to address him. This time, however, Elijah was present. It was probably the Spirit of God who had directed Elijah to remain out of sight the first time because God was dealing with Naaman about his pride. God knew who to get, God knew how to get Naaman to reveal his attitudes to himself, and the Lord then gave him the grace to change them. It all resulted in a miraculous healing and led to a man with a wholly different perspective about himself. It also led Naaman to a different perspective of Israel's God, for he now proclaimed that he knew there was no other God on earth. It is sad that many people never turn to God for salvation because of the pride that causes them to think that they do not need him. Questions. One, what important position did Naaman hold? Two, in what other ways is Naaman described and what does each description indicate about him? Three, what marred the exalted position and reputation that Naaman enjoyed? Four, what seemingly insignificant person suddenly became significant to Naaman and his king? Five, what did the, 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 did the, Syr the Syrian king do after hearing Naaman's report? Six, what happened after the king's request reached the king of Israel? Seven, what did Elijah instruct Naaman to do? Eight, how did Naaman respond and what were his reasons for doing so? Nine, how did Naaman become convinced he should do what Elijah had said and what was the result. 10. What happened after Naaman saw he had been completely cleansed? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, August 18, 2024. Thank you for listening. God bless.